So, up to you, Olivier. Okay, uh, welcome uh, to everybody. Uh, this presentation is going to be about uh, prototype pollution attack. Uh, so, first of all, who am I? Uh, I do these days mostly pen tests and a bit of security research. Uh, before starting in InfoSec, I used to do lots of web level pen, uh, mostly front end. So, this is where I learned most of the JavaScript that's going to be presented here. So the plan for this presentation is I'm going to first do a brief introduction to JavaScript, uh, but I'm going to focus very much on the part that are going to be abused uh, through this presentation. Uh, we're going to go after that, what can allow prototype pollution to happen? Uh, how can it be exploited? And I'm going to leave a few notes on how uh, these type of attack can be mitigated. So the first thing that's really interesting in JavaScript is that is the way class are declared and work. Uh, Let's say you want to, uh, first of all, uh, declare a class that's called dog. It first starts as a function. And the way you add a method to classes is you add them on what's called the prototype. So if you want to have a method that's going to be there f on all instances of dog, we're going to do dog, which is the function, dot prototype, dot talk, equals the function. And now after that, all instances of dog have the function name talk. Uh, What's also good to, to note in JavaScript is that uh, all the objects inherit from a base, ob uh, a base object that's named object. And the base object comes with a few interesting properties. Uh, one of the interesting properties is called constructor. And constructor points back to uh, the constructor uh, for which the object was created. So here, if we have an instance of Doug, uh, the instance.constructor is going to point to the function of Doug. And si if we're able to point to the function of Doug, uh, this also means that we can reach the prototype of it by doing constructor.prototype. And what's really also interesting is that since the ECMAScript 6 standard was introduced, there was a magic property that's named proto that does essentially the constructor.prototype thing uh, all at once. Uh, what's also good to note is that there's two notations to access property on an object, and uh, they both allow uh, access to the same property, uh, and there's no uh, differentiation between whether the property is of type uh, function or is simply an object. So this is like all mixed up uh, together. Um, so what is prototype pollution? Uh, prototype pollution is a term that, that was coined uh, a long while ago. Uh, people used to do lots of experimentation to add sort of like extension method uh, to base types like object. So let's say if you wanted to have a function that, that's called contains the answer on all objects that are insti instantiated. Uh, you could add it on the prototype of object, and it would sort of add uh, extension method uh, to it. Uh, one of the first library that leveraged this a lot was called Prototype JS. Uh, however, uh, what was found uh, to, the, to the usage of this library and other experimentation is that it is actually a really bad idea to do this kind of thing uh, because it causes a lot of uh, incompatibilities between uh, all the libraries that uh, start adding all their things on the prototype of object. So this is not considered a very bad practice, and you're not going to actually see this uh, a lot. So if, uh, but this presentation is not going to be about developers shooting themselves in the foot by uh, actually trying to add extension method on object. This is mostly going to be about what if an attacker can actually start doing those things, can actually start adding property on the prototype of object. So the first thing that we're going to need to ask ourselves is what can even allow an attacker to uh, have add properties on the prototype of object. And there's a few uh, operations in which I found uh, there were vulnerable uh, implementation that could allow prototype pollutions to happen if we are able to control some parameters. Uh, one of the first class of operations that I found to be, uh, to, to be susceptible to these type of things was a merge operation. Merge operation can be seen at a very, very high level as you have two objects with each uh, a set of different properties and you want to merge them together. And there's also uh, some priority that's given to uh, the last arguments. So basically, we have two objects. It becomes one with all the properties merged together. And the way merge operation that uh, were affected, uh, were implemented, worked, uh, worked in this way. Basically, they start by iterating all the properties that exist on the second object, and if uh, the property exists on the first and the second object, and they are both of type object, it start it recursively uh, merge uh, those things. Uh, but where it gets really really interesting is if the pr the the attributes value over here uh, 
is name underscore underscore proto underscore underscore. Well, this value always exists on object and is also of type object, which means that uh, if we have this value that is defined over here, it's always going to be true that it's going to be defined and existing. And what's going to happen is if we can control uh, on the second side what's defined inside the proto uh, property, uh, this value over here is going to point to the prototype of object. So when it's going to recurse into this, uh, the A value is going to be the prototype of object, this, and the keys that are going to be set here are going to be the keys that, are, uh, that we define in the second part. So basically, if we have, this is the base object that we're going to merge properties into, and this is the user input that uh, we uh, control. So here we have a proto uh, property where we added a property named polluted, and when we merge those together with a, an implementation that's affected, uh, now all instances of object have an, a property that's named polluted with the value of one. And this is true not just for uh, objects that are created after uh, the pollution happen, but it also pollutes all the existing objects that were previously created. So uh, for those, there was lots of library which had a vulnerable implementation. Uh, the two most popular libraries that I found to be affected were Lodash and Oak. Uh, for both of these, there were CVE that were, uh, that were uh, released. Uh, so if you have Node.js project, you probably have been notified by this, but didn't knew too much what, the, what this was all about. Uh, also, uh, all the details as to uh, all the libraries uh, that were fixed and which versions they were fixed is all going to be uh, in the paper that I'm going to link at the end. So for this kind of detail, it's all going to be uh, listed there. So the second class of operation that I found to be susceptible to this type of problem are, are clone operation. Clone operation are basically you have an object and you want to create a full copy of it. And the way I found, and the way some implementation were uh, vulnerable to prototype pollution through these operation is if they, they implemented a clone as uh, a merge on an empty object. Uh, basically, uh, this does a clone. However, if the merge operation that's being used to do this is affected by the, bu by the bug that's previously mentioned, uh, when you're going to be using uh, this clone operation, it's also going to cause prototype pollution to happen with the same effect. Uh, for, for these types, I only found one library which was affected. So this is probably in practice a rather uh, niche uh, edge, edge case that's uh, less likely to be seen. Uh, the third one that's really interesting is that there's a bunch of library which allows uh, values to be defined by a path. Basically, uh, we start by having an object which has a, a set of property, and if we want to set object.b.test equals one, two, three, some uh, API allows, and, and some libraries allows us to do this by defining a path. And here, if the attacker is able to control this part of the path, uh, it can start defining the path to be on proto underscore polluted, and if you control also the volume, what's going to happen is that the prototype of object is also going to be uh, polluted. Uh, for those libraries, uh, this is essentially something that's working by design. So this is un highly unlikely that there's ever going to be a patch. Uh, I spoke to a few uh, maintainers which had uh, affected library, and the general consensus is that it's somewhat by design. So for those libraries, you have to be super careful n never to allow uh, the path to be fully controlled by uh, user input. So exploitation time. Uh, when I started to do this research, uh, this was already uh, some interesting uh, cases, uh, but I wanted to see up to which point it was exploitable in practice. So I looked through a bunch of uh, open source projects uh, that were using uh, Node.js, and the one that I found to be uh, a good uh, case study for this was Ghost CMS. At the time I did this research, the latest version was 1.19.2, so if you want to reproduce everything that's being uh, discussed here, this is the version that you have to install. It was a fairly large application, it's, fa it's fairly uh, used, and, and most importantly, uh, it used one of the uh, affected library with user input. So we actually add something uh, that we could pollute the prototype with, and I wanted to see up to what point this was exploitable. So the first thing we need to do is to identify where uh, the prototype pollution can occur. Uh, in the case of uh, Go CMS, one of the unauthenticated endpoints, uh, which was used for password reset, uh, used the vulnerable merge of Lodash, which is over here, and the portion of the data that we control is options.data. Options.data is essentially, uh, in this context, uh, the body 
uh, of the post request that we send to that uh, password reset uh, endpoint. So even though we don't fully control options, as long as we control part of the structure, uh, the prototype pollution is going to occur. So it basically gives us a base request uh, like this. So basically, we have the password reset endpoint. There's a few values to make sure that we reach uh, the vulnerable merge. And we have here the underscore proto. And over here, this is going to be where all the properties that we want to add on the prototype of object, where they're going to be. So one of the first things uh, that makes it really hard to exploit uh, this kind of vulnerability is whenever you add a single property, it messes up a lot of the execution uh, of the, the application. So the biggest problem that you have is whenever you pollute one single property, everything starts crashing. So this is not uh, something that, that's interest that's, this is not something that's that interesting if you want to do more than just a denial of service. So uh, the general approach that I took that I think is kind of the good one is to first identify which endpoints as uh, some behavior that you want to exploit. And you're going to try to, first of all, fix it in a way uh, that it's going to finally reach uh, the point that you want it to reach. And in this case, uh, the target endpoint that I choose was the main page. And the reason I wanted to reach uh, the main page is that, uh, it, uh, it is that the main page actually rendered some templates. And the reason templates are a really good target for prototype pollution is that very often the way te templates are compiled is that they use uh, intermediate structure that are then converted to JavaScript code, then executed. So if we can uh, pollute the properties uh, during the uh, compilation of those templates, uh, we're going to we we're going to have the potential to have JavaScript code that's going to be executed on the server. So there's a few strategies that we can use to kind of fix uh, the uh, all the the things that are gonna, that are going to be messed up. Basically, uh, the way we're going to fix things is we're going to first start by uh, polluting a random property. It's going to crash when we're going to try to render the main page. We're going to figure out why it crashes. We're going to fix that local crash. We're going to retry the payload. It's going to crash again elsewhere. And we're going to continue th this in an iterative process until it finally uh, renders the whole thing. So the first strategy that we can use to uh, fix uh, things is to figure out if there are simply some properties that are missing. Uh, in this case of this payload, uh, one of the issues that I had is that during the execution, when uh, properties were polluted, uh, the object over here results uh, didn't have any of those meta pagination pages property. So what happened is that uh, it triggered an error, w which caused the the whole page to crash, and it wouldn't reach the endpoints uh, that I wanted. So here, what we're going to do is, since meta doesn't exist, we're going to pollute the meta property with uh, this value. And the next time we're going to try this payload, uh, the meta property is now going to exist, and it's going to have those property. So it's now going to work, and it's going to continue further in the execution. Uh, the second strategy is sometimes the crashes are going to occur in places where uh, there's not much you can do to, uh, to avoid the crashes by simply adding properties. So if you're stuck in a situation like this, you have to, to look at what at all the conditions that, uh, that made it reach uh, that point where it cra the crashes is kind of inevitable. And look if there are ways uh, to add properties so that it, it takes a completely different code path and it no, no longer takes uh, the path that's going to always crash. Um, the, ter the third strategy is something that's really, really interesting about prototype pollution is if you pollute a property that's of type object, uh, now all objects are going to be have sort of an infinite depth. And the reason is that if, for example, we pollute foo with an empty object, the thing that's going to happen is that uh, foo is going to be of type object, which means if it's of type object, it's also going to have the property foo. So now foo.foo is also pointing back to the empty object, which has a property foo. And the reason this can be really problematic is if there are algorithms in the programs that do sort of recursive operation on object where the iterates the property. If it's of type object, it recurs into it. Uh, the problem is that since the, the objects are all going to have uh, infinite depth, uh, it's going to crash due to stack overflow exception. Uh, so the program is going to crash, which is not desirable. And the way you can fix those kind of problem is by adding what I would call kind of a stop property. So here, uh, instead of just polluting an empty object, we're also going to uh, pollute the object in a way that it's going to contain uh, the attributes, uh, the property foo. And what's going to happen is now when we do foo.foo, since this value 
uh, overrides the value that's on the prototype, it's simply going to be of type string. And in most cases, this is going to prevent all the, uh, the infinite recursions uh, issue. So now, now, now that we have done this re uh, iterative process uh, until the main page finally renders, it probably renders with garbage data, but that's not much of an issue. We're going to look at what we can pollute to have interesting behavior. And one of the first things uh, that, I, that I noticed about the way Ghost CMS worked is that the template to be rendered uh, once the, the pages uh, finished executing was lazy loaded. And what's really interesting about lazy loading is that the value first starts as undefined, and then whenever it sets or it checks whether it's defined, it, ch it checks if the value is already exists. And if it already exists, it says, well, it's already loaded. The value is good. I'm going to continue. So here, if we pollute the value that's over here, underscore templates, uh, the program is simply going to think that the value was already loaded. And every time uh, pages is, go is going to be rendered, we're going to be in control of which templates gets rendered, which is something that's really interesting. So here, we can control which template is going to be uh, rendered. But this is not uh, the end of the exploit, uh, mostly because uh, the templates has to have the HBS extension, which means we're not going to be able to do uh, local file read and other things like, like that. So we have to pick a template that's interesting. So I first started by pointing to a template that was like, like TMP. And I did a bit of fuzzing to figure out uh, what was interesting in combination of what the template had to contain and which properties could be added so that some JavaScript code ended up being uh, in the final uh, JavaScript code that was generated for the templates. So what I identified was that uh, partial invocation uh, was the best thing uh, to be corrupted. And there was a value that's called block params uh, that ended up being uh, directly in the JavaScript code uh, that was included. I'm just going to take a bit of water. OK, so now. Uh, once this was identified, I simply had to find a template which contained a partial invocation uh, that could be used. Uh, however, when I looked at all the templates that were uh, used by Ghost CMS, when I tried to use these, even if some contains partial invocation, the problem that I had is most of the templates were quite complex, and the compilation, uh, due to the corruptions, ended up completely crashing if it contains uh, too many things outside of partial invocation. Uh, but what I, what I found to be rather interesting is that there's a lot of package uh, that are shipped with all their test cases. And one of the packages that ships with all its test cases is called Express HBS. And what's really convenient is that all those test cases are a really, really minimal uh, HBS file that can all be uh, pointed to and used. And here, uh, one, of, one of those uh, test cases uh, simply contains a partial invocation that I needed and about nothing else. So this was really uh, something that was really useful, because otherwise I would have to uh, to figure out why the compilation for more complex template crashed and try to fix it, which would have been taken probably a lot more time to finish the export. But here, we have test data that's shipped in production. So thank you, Express HBS. <laughs> so after this, the properties that we have polluted is essentially the templates that I've linked here. And here, this is like the structure that's used. It's one of the intermediate structure that's used by the uh, HBS uh, compiler. And here, the value over here, this is the value that's going to end up directly being uh, in the final template that's going to be compiled. OK, so demo. Uh, yeah, I don't have my laptop here, but thankfully, I recorded everything. So yeah. I'm just going to do pause. OK, so wait a minute. This is like not my laptop, so. OK, so we first of all start, we have like a blank. Uh, this is like a stock install of uh, Ghost CMS. We can see that it works properly. And now what we're going to do is uh, we have our full request with like all the payloads. And we have over here the uh, what, what we're going to execute. And what's good to mention is that uh, since uh, the JavaScript code ends up in a context where it's evolved, uh, the require function is not directly accessible. So you have this to use this sort of global process, main module, uh, constructor, underscore load. This is roughly the equivalent of require. So here, the payload that we're going to do is we're going to require a child process, and we're going to execute kcal, which is like going to make a calculator appear. So 
The first request is simply going to corrupt the state of the application, so the calculator is not going to pop uh, right now. So what's going to happen is now the state of the application is completely corrupted, and the endpoint crashes. But what's interesting is uh, whenever we're going to refresh the main page, uh, we're going to have the, the calculator that's going to now be executed. <laughs> yeah, and now I still have a, a bit of time. So how can this issue uh, be mitigated? One of the interesting things that we introduced in ECMAScript 5 is there's actually kind of a way of freezing, of making uh, object uh, completely uh, immutable. And this is probably the least used API that was released in uh, ECMAScript 5. But this is actually really useful now because we can actually fix uh, the fact that the prototype of object is modifiable at runtime. So we can actually make the prototype of object immutable. And this, and what's going to happen every time there's going to be a property that's going to uh, that's going to be uh, tried to be assigned to on the prototype of object, it's simply going to uh, silently fail, which means the, the assignment is going to be done, but it's going to have no effect. So this can completely prevent uh, prototype pollution for uh, the object type, which is, I think, something that should be probably the default behavior uh, in JavaScript. Um, also, uh, one of the interesting things that I've seen uh, some project do uh, that really prevents a lot of the issue with prototype pollution is to do uh, what's called a JSON schema validation. Essentially, uh, you have endpoints which, which accept JSON data. You can define a sort of a structure that defines which fields are expected, what are their types, and you can also make sure that there, there are no extra attributes that are allowed. So not only it, this is going to prevent prototype pollution from being possible as the attacker is no longer going to be able to control the structure, but it's also going to prevent issues like mass assignment or any other issues where the type expected by the server is not exactly the one. Um, also in ECMAScript 6, uh, they also introduce a uh, map, which are essentially a way to, to finally do maps properly, because before a lot of the, because before the way people uh, created map was simply to use empty object. However, when you're using empty object, it comes with all the, pro the base property of the type object, which has a lot of undesirable effect as we've seen in this presentation. So it's now kind of recommended to start switching uh, uh, object to map whenever it's being used for the purpose of being used as a map. And yeah, and this is the link uh, to, the, to this presentation. It's gonna contain all the video, the slides, and also have a white paper which describes uh, everything that I've talked about today and uh, a bit more too.